Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. I today am overwhelmed by the size and the beauty of what I have before me. I have before me the new annotated Sherlock Holmes. It's described as the two slip, two slip cased volumes. And we are fortunate enough to have with us the editor of it all, Leslie S. Klinger. And I must mention, it's all published by W.W. W. Norton. Welcome and thanks for coming by. Thank you. You know, the fact that uh, uh, for you, Sherlock Holmes is is a passion and not a career uh, really kind of kind of amazes me. Uh, it, it says here that you've been playing with this since 1968 or so, probably before that, but that's what they're admitting. But that in, quote, real life, if you will, <laughs> you pursue a legal career in tax estate and business planning. Yes. Um, the, how, well, how do you do all this? A lot of weekend time. <laughs> um, it, it's it's worked out well. My Our kids are grown and my wife is very indulgent of my uh, hobby. And in fact, I think secretly relishes that I leave her alone on the weekends. <laughs> nothing, nothing like a happy wife. Huh? That's right. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you belong to uh, is the... Uh, Baker Street Irregulars, and actually you also serve as the series editor of something called the Manuscript Series of the Baker Street Irregulars. What's that all about? Well, the Baker Street Irregulars is a now um, 70-year-old literary society that was formed by a group of people who love the Sherlock Holmes stories and seek to perpetuate the memory of uh, Sherlock Holmes. The Manuscript Series is... Uh, a recent undertaking of the BSI to publish facsimiles of manuscripts of material that haven't been made available to the public before. For example, um, we published the play called The Angels of Darkness. Okay. We and uh, are there other stories that have been undiscovered? Um, no, but for example, we published a manuscript of the Six Napoleons. When I say the manuscript, I mean the handwritten oh manuscript, a facsimile of that. And then commentary on the story and the manuscript and how it had changed from manuscript to print and so on. Now, there's another book that uh, is yours. I, I don't know whether to say put together or you wrote the first volume of a Sherlock Holmes reference library. Right. That's actually six volumes at this point. Um, it's a it's a different version of um, what's in the new annotated. It's it's a much more academic version. Someone, I think, nailed it, saying it was law review style <laughs> uh, with extensive quotations from contemporary Victorian sources, page references and all that. Uh huh. Very little illustrations. Um, eventually, it'll, when it's finished, it'll be all nine volumes, the volumes corresponding to the original volumes in which the home stories were published. Okay. The present work, the new annotated Sherlock Holmes, in, in a sense, uh, is, is, is a descendant of a book written by or put together by William Baring Gold also called The Annotated Sherlock Holmes, which is a book you dearly love, I take Absolutely. it. Um, Absolutely. It's really, first of all, it's what started me down this path in, in the first place. Um, I started reading it when I was in law school. Uh, I desperately needed something to read that wasn't law books, and I just <laughs> got hooked on it. And I really got hooked on the cult of Sherlock Holmes, the whole scholarship about Holmes. And when I was that age, I dreamed that someday perhaps I would take up my pen and try and update or expand Baring Gould. And uh, here we are 37 years later. And uh, you've done it <laughs> a lot sooner than I ever expected to. Really, I thought this was going to be when I retired. That's but because your wife leaves you alone on the you weekend. Bet. That's the whole that's my the whole wife story. pushed me into this. So content wise, and if I'm missing, if I'm counting Counting incorrectly, volume one, it seems to me, has 24 stories divided into two sets, Adventures of Sherlock Holmes and the Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. Right, which is the those are the first two uh, collections that were published. The stories were published in the Strand Magazine, Strand Magazine. Mm -hmm. from 1891 to 1893. And now volume two, according to my count, uh, contains some 32 stories. 13 published between 1903 and 1905. And uh, then there are seven stories and 12 stories 
uh, published respectively under uh, The Last Bow and The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes. Correct. I'm um, counting well. I... You're counting perfectly. Now, the, what's amazing to me is that these stories appeared over, actually, if you go back to the study in Scarlet, they appeared over a 40-year span. Oh, how many years? 40 years, from 1887 to 1927. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. The other thing that uh, that we haven't talked about uh, is, and, and I want to get to it at some point, is that there are 702 vintage illustrations, and I also want to talk about, of all things, the way the notes are presented. But as befits a work about the great detective, the new annotated Sherlock Holmes upholds a game and perpetuates a gentle fiction. Don't get it? Stay tuned, and you will. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. This is a Sherlock Holmes Day on Conversations on the Coast. We're talking about the new annotated Sherlock Holmes, a two slip cased volume opus, and it's edited by our guest today, Leslie Klinger. Now, one of the things that I do want to touch on, if only briefly, is two of the beautiful parts about the book, I think. And this, these books are beautiful. One, the vintage illustrations. How did you put all that stuff together? Well, um, mostly I went out and tried to gather together. I, I have a very large collection anyway, but I, I gathered together a lot of the old um appearances of this. The, the stories appeared in the Strand Magazine. They also appeared in a number of um, American newspapers, as well as uh, Harper's Weekly when the memoirs came around. Okay. And and I tried to collect as many of the original sources as I could and then reproduce them. These are all public domain illustrations, but I wanted to, the public to see them. I don't think there's ever been as illustrated an edition of the canon of this, this before. This is absolutely marvelous. Now, the other thing that astounds me is that because it's it's the kind of work that it is, there are lots and lots of what we would call footnotes. But here, they're not at the foot. They are in a contrasting color opposite the text. This is gorgeous. I got to tell you, it's really fantastic because, you know, you, you see something and then you see the the footnote number and you don't have to go all the way to the back or someplace like that. It's right there. Who had who decided that? Well, Baring Gould's original annotated Sherlock Holmes had a similar style, although there were a lot fewer notes. Um, and uh, Norton is the one that came up with the plan of the alternating colors. I, I agree with you. I think it's gorgeous. Norton just did a beautiful job on yeah. producing these books. Okay. Now, I, I want to talk about uh, the business of upholding the game. And I want to, I'll read from. The, the press release, which sometimes is equal to the truth and sometimes is close to it and sometimes is not near to it at all. It says here in the press release, you uphold the game of treating the stories as biography, not fiction. And you note the fact that the stories of Sherlock Holmes, with only a few exceptions, were written by his close friend, John H. Watson, M.D., Dr. Watson. The idea is that Conan Doyle, a fine writer in his own field of historical fiction, helped a struggling young writer, a fellow physician, Dr. Watson, to break into print and thereafter profited greatly by serving as Watson's literary agent. Now, why do you Sherlockians, and I finally got to say the word, why do you Sherlockians call this a game? Isn't it the result of research? Well, yes, but we it's got to be played with, with tongue firmly in cheek, ah. albeit very seriously. Arthur Conan Doyle was a wonderful writer, um, and I don't ever want to, the books you'll notice are dedicated to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Correct. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't ever want to take anything away. The game is a very nice way to approach the stories. Somebody asked me why I liked this approach, and I said, I think it makes the Victorian era come alive in a way that approaching them in the sort of, excuse the expression, Oxford annotated Sherlock Holmes <laughs> Edition. Well, you can say that. It's okay. <laughs> they they did that. They did it for English majors. I, I was an English major once upon a time, but this to me is much more interesting. Uh huh. Now, the other thing that you say, and this is, I think, in your in your intro or preface, whatever, I perpetuate the gentle fiction 
that Holmes and Watson really lived, and that, except as noted, Dr. John H. Watson wrote the stories about Sherlock Holmes, even though he graciously allowed them to be published under the byline of his colleague and literary agent, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Now, why is that a fiction? Again, I... I get I, I love the game, but I, I want to get into it. I want the inside story. Well, as I say, I, I don't I, I don't want to sound like an idiot. I no, guess. no, that's my job. <laughs> I get asked when I teach a, when I teach a course on Sherlock Holmes. I, after about an hour of the course, this which begins with Sherlock Holmes was born on January sixth, eighteen fifty four, and then his I talk about his parents. And sesquicentennial all that. is what it is, kids. Right, I, I so know that word. After about an hour of the course, um, I often get a student who stands up and says, uh, Mr. Klinger, was Sherlock Holmes real or fictional? Uh, and okay. the answer, of course, yeah. is yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Both. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, So, uh, therefore, when I look at the chronology, okay, and I and I and I played with that for for a while and it there, there comes a point in the chronology which goes on for many many pages, and the, and the chronology covers Holmes, Watson, Conan Doyle, and then uh, current events. Yes. Okay. So after a while, what 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 confused me is that we have everybody is publishing the darn things: Watson, Holmes, and Conan Doyle. Well, it's not really different publication dates. What I've showed in the table are the dates that the events described in the stories occurred in the Holmes column, in the Watson column, when he published the stories. Okay, hold on to that. We'll learn more about the chronology when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC. Or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com. Conversations on the Coast is the program. The new annotated Sherlock Holmes is the book and the guest, the wonderful Leslie Klinger. Now, we were in the middle of chronology here, and I posed a rather dumb question, I, I guess, that at a certain point as I was going through the chronology, it appeared to me that uh, everybody was publishing the stories, Holmes, Watson, and Doyle. Can you straighten me out on that point? Yes. The the column that says Holmes is an attempt uh, to synthesize the work of 14 or 15 different scholars who have sat down and tried to figure out when the events that are described in the stories occurred. This is tough because some of the stories have very vague dates. Some have precise dates. One of them even has an impossible date. Uh <laughs> Oh, what fun! Absolutely, and that's and and, and that's what's in the Holmes. Column. That's in the Holmes column. Now, in the, the Watson, Watson column, column that reflects the dates that he published those stories. And in the Doyle column, all I really put in there was the date that the collections were published. Oh, okay. Uh, so, all right. Now, I, I I don't want to leave our folks without another encomium concerning this book by Martin Gardner, editor of the Annotated Alice. No Sherlockian, there's that word again, here or around the world can fail to be overwhelmed and overjoyed by Leslie Klinger's annotated edition of Watson's Collections of Holmes's Most Colorful Cases. The book's more than 2,000 notes are awesome in their scope and erudition, and they're pretty besides. There are hundreds of illustrations alone are worth the book's price, a marvelous milestone in Sherlockian criticism. Congratulations. That's Thank you. Really, that's really terrific. One of the nice things that I uh, came across in uh, reading around was was how the, the, the Watson-Holmes relationship began. And I would characterize it as two men each needing something, and then they you know came together and voila, this, this wonderment happened. Absolutely. There, there was Watson uh, just... Fresh out of his military service in uh, Afghanistan, interestingly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, idle, 
didn't know what to do with himself in London, heard through a friend that someone else was looking for someone to share a flat, uh, was introduced to Holmes. And actually, for the first few months of their being together, he really didn't understand what Holmes did. He had these very strange people that used to come visit him all the time. Finally, Holmes, I guess, felt good enough about Watson to invite him to come along on an investigation. That turns out to be the novel called A Study in Scarlet. And at the end of uh, that investigation, they have a conversation about whether, you know, Holmes says to uh, uh, Watson says to Holmes, don't you think we ought to, you know, put this down and and record it? And Holmes says, "Mm, well, you may do what you like. And, and wow, look what that story. That's right. And in fact, Holmes really sort of ribs Watson continually throughout their partnership about his stories. He complains that Watson has turned what should have been a series of scientific demonstrations into romances. Mm. But then you have, an, an, I guess, an authority uh, such as Ronald Knox, who who, who says – Any studies in Sherlock Holmes must be first and foremost studies in Dr. Watson. Absolutely. That's that's like more than a partnership. Absolutely. I I think that while Holmes is really the icon, it's Watson that draws us back to these stories all the time. The, The humanity of the man, the tremendous qualities of French friendship and steadfastness. And it's always his voice that we hear. He's the one who sees things and and tells us these stories. Holmes's few efforts at writing stories himself uh, fall pretty flat, actually. Uh huh. Are they are they part of this? Yes. Gathering the, the lion's mane uh, is one of them. And mm-hmm. the other is well, his last bow is written in the third person. Uh, the other one is the Blanche soldier that Holmes wrote up. And they're frankly, they're not very good. Hmm. I think we're kind of running out of time, but we, I have to ask you to tell the story of Sherlock Holmes' disappearance and resurrection. Well, this was, uh, this was an event that uh, drove the Victorian world uh, a little bit crazy. We have to put the story in perspective and remember that this was the mass media of the time, the Strand Magazine, not, not television, not radio. So in 1891, Holmes uh, battled Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls. And in the story, The Final Problem, Watson reported to the world that Holmes had presumably died. He had gone over the falls with with Moriarty. That was published in 1892. And it wasn't until 1901 that the public got any further word of Holmes at all. That was at the Hound of the Baskervilles. But that was really called a reminiscence of Holmes. It was clearly pre-Reichenbach. Not till 1903 did Watson publish The Empty House, revealing like those old cliffhangers that Holmes hadn't really gone over the falls. And he lived. He did. And there were more stories to come. And every last one of them beautifully presented in the new annotated Sherlock Holmes, put together, edited, if you will, by Leslie Klinger. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.